1919 was quite a historic year in many ways. The Treaty of Versailles was signed to end World War I. Nancy Astor became the first woman to sit in the UK House of Commons. On 25th October 1919, at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, the Medical Women International Association was formed. Dr. Esther Lovejoy was chosen to be the first president. Popularly known by its acronym MUYA, the Medical Women International Association was established to champion the cause of female medical doctors from 90 countries in six continents around the world. Who is Medical Women's International Association? It's a global NGO, as you already know, comprising of medical women in different specialities. We were founded, listen to this, in 1919. Next year, in a few months' time, we celebrate our centenary. We, we are older than the UN, than the WHO, than many other medical uh, associations. Just like mothers, we gave birth to all these international associations. The motto of the association is Matris Animo Curante, healing with the touch of a mother. And the main objective of the association is to um, make an impact in women's health globally. I've been asked by many people, why do we need actually an all-female association, you know? Men suffer in medicine. You know, women are increasing in numbers. There will be more medical students which are female, you know. Women actually dominating very soon the medical world. We don't need an association for women. And I said, of course, it is important because we are strong in numbers, but I think we have still some room for being strong in achievements, saying equal pay, you know, having equal rights, having a voice on politics. And I realized that when it comes to decisions about health and health issues, women are not often at the table. As I've said many times before, in different meetings all over the world, there must be nothing about women without women sitting at the table. There must be space. And we are the ones who will demand for that space at the policy formulating table. Because if we don't, we shall not partake this dinner. We shall remain on the menu. What I have found is that when women participate in leadership, they focus on issues that affect women and children. When we become leaders, we can change situations because we are in those positions. The Near East and Africa region held a conference from the 12th to 14th November 2018 in Nairobi, Kenya. The magnificent Movenpick Hotel was the venue for this meeting, which attracted over 400 participants. The theme for the 2018 conference was Accelerating Women's Health Agenda, 
priorities and opportunities through SDGs. The conference was hosted by the Kenya Medical Women's Association. Its current president is Dr. Christine Sadia. It is my sincere gratitude and honor to welcome the delegates of the 2018 Nairobi Mwea Regional Conference for Near Eastern Africa. This is my humble duty and pleasure that I've been supported by quite a number of sisters locally, but also sisters out the globe because of the sake of this conference. And therefore, the sisters in Kenya, thank you for the emissaries that you did and even reaching out to other sisters. We did it the first time when Dr. Manguyo was in command and we have done it again. So we thank God for it. We don't boast about it, but it is God's grace that we are here today. The chief guest at the conference was Honorable Beth Mugo, who is a nominated senator in Kenya. She's also a former cabinet minister for public health. The progress of a society is determined by the consciousness of its women. For this reason, I take this early opportunity to commend the Medical Women International Association for coming together to promote health. I find the theme of this conference, which is accelerating women's health agenda, priorities and opportunities through sustainable development goals, and the African Union Agenda 2063, very relevant and timely. This conference comes to Kenya at a time when our president, His Excellency, Honorable Uhuru Kenyatta's government, has declared the promotion of affordable health as one of his big four development agenda and as his legacy. It is my hope that at the end of this conference, we shall come out more energized with new ideas and concrete measures that can help improve the health of the people, especially women and children. The keynote address was given by Dr. Joyce Banda, the first female president of the Republic of Malawi and the founder of the Joyce Banda Foundation, which works to advance the status of women in the country. It is an honor for me to be with you here in Nairobi on the occasion of the Medical Women's International Association Regional Conference for Far East and Africa. I would like to congratulate the Kenya Medical Women's Association for hosting this conference at a time such as this and taking leadership in advocating for women's health and well-being throughout the region. I came to share my thoughts about how we, ordinary people, can play a part. But let me tell you that since I see in this room there's no other president but me, maybe and then I can talk from a point of strength, that leadership is a love affair. You must fall in love with the people you save, and the people must fall in love with you. And that is what I call a servant leader. I say this because sometimes my fellow leaders blame me. They say, why do you talk about leaders all the time? And, and I say, well, maybe as an African woman, let me say, give you this analogy. 72 people are driving, are in a bus, and the driver is taking them to a point X. And they end up in a ditch. The people will say, what was wrong with the driver? Was he drunk? Was he dozing? That's what a leader is. When things go wrong, it's about the leader. And I'm saying, when women die giving life in any country, and the figures keep going up, it is the fault of the leader. And we shall hold them accountable. And I'm glad the African Union is here. Because now we shall name and shame. Because presidents must put in place programs that will reduce maternal mortality. It's a necessary death. It's not even in the Bible that we shall have pain and then we shall die. They didn't say that. So we don't have to die. And I refuse that we should die 
and I am asking my fellow leaders on the continent that enough is enough. We shall not die giving life. May God bless you. The conference had several plenary sessions and parallel meetings with presentations by top women scientists from the region and beyond. You know, our goal, just to remind you, is not only to focus on women's well-being and health, which of course is very important, but we also care about physicians. So our goal is in addition to advance physicians and to make them flourish and progress and to make the best of their competences. So this talk is about one focus of the work MWA is doing and I wanted to introduce this to, to you as well because we feel it's not only working on behalf of women and children, we also work on behalf for you. So, so there's attempts to blame systemic healthcare and workplace challenges on women in medicine. The fear that women work shorter hours, a fear echoed last year by a male doctor in the US who said that if women physicians want to make more, they should just work harder. Other pushback includes the fact that women are choosing to go into family medicine, pediatrics, psychiatry, and OBGYN have the highest number of women in medicine and we are lacking women in orthopedics and not making progress in diagnostic radiology and neurosurgery. Studies have found that women physicians are five times more likely to experience opposition to career advancement and three times more likely to experience actions they perceive to be disrespectful or punitive within the workplace. So what we don't like, we try to change. So we are disruptive. So whatever is needed, we try to do. So we advocate for policies on gender-based discrimination and harassment. So we have disrupted the traditional practice of medicine, and we need to keep being disruptors. So in our country, Mali, we say that uh, the maternal uh, rate of mortality is very high. We say this again and again. I've got to say that this rate that we qualify as high represent and represents what is uh, really documented in uh, hospital centers. That is to say that uh, sometimes we, do, we haven't had a study in Mali talking about uh, maternal and uh, uh, the deaths that are happening in uh, uh, the households, the number of uh, people who die is very high uh, for uh, comparing what happens at home and uh, in hospitals. And uh, we haven't really had an evaluation since 2012. Now, given the results, we are able to see that uh, maternal, maternal uh, mortality and uh, the, ch the number of children who die, this is not very well documented uh, back home. Using new technology, just like the mobile phone, uh, this has really helped us to carry out this study. So this mobile phone can be really a very good tool to improve the results, to improve uh, the way we are carrying out things. And then uh, we could now come up with the decisions to take care of uh, children and uh, uh, ch children and mothers. I'm interested in the fact that you are getting more enrollment of women into the medical space. My question is, is it that the women are pushing and making their presence felt in the space, or the men are finding better paying jobs and leaving the field to us? Mateno deaths. We would really like to know what is the number of total deliveries given this high mortality rate in one village. 
I think this is very, very important. In uh, one health district, you can get about uh, 30 villages. So it's not uh, a single village, but you're talking about two health uh, districts. And uh, in uh, one health district, you can get a uh, number of villages. So it's on a period of uh, 15 months. Uh, my first question is to uh, Millicent Olulu. Um, you spoke extensively about um, the women making savings that will take care of themselves and perhaps their children. Is there any plan for the men? We have a problem. Over 85% of invasive cervical cancer cases which are diagnosed in the world come from our part of the world. We are not doing well. I'll ask the lady from Ghana on cervical cancer. You said you have improved. So can you give us statistics before you started the awareness campaign? Uh, what was the statistics? Um, the lady from Ghana also. I want to know um, what kind of screening you do. Is it VIA? Is it pap smear? You didn't say what kind of screening you do. At Aga Khan University, and my question is to Dr. Elizabeth Mishika. Merci beaucoup pour votre présentation. Thank you very much for your presentation. I would like to know, particularly, do we have a difference between uh, the West and uh, DRC uh, with regard to uh, maternal and infant mortality? And uh, what are these kind of differences with? regard to these uh, uh, centers that you are setting up for women. Uh, to uh, finish up, we would like to say that today, uh, thanks to this conference that you've organized, we need to focus on these areas that have been forgotten, these areas that are unsupported, and where women are dying to ensure that in uh, the coming days uh, they have uh, access to quality health care. What are the reasons for these maternal deaths? We know that women don't show up to the clinic uh, uh, soon enough. They don't feel that they have the financial means to, to access these services. The quality of care at the healthcare facilities is, is poor. They're very often, in, especially in rural areas, understaffed, poor medication supply. And this comprehensive, uh, this needs to be addressed comprehensively because there's so many different uh, problems addressing it. I understand in this audience, all of us know that family planning, particularly uh, access to safe and voluntary family planning is human right. And we also saw that family planning is central in gender equity and women's empowerment, reducing poverty, and uh, achieving sustainable development. We saw that several human stories there that if women has no access to family planning, this threatens their ability to build a better future for themselves, for their families, and for their you know, communities. And now, talking about reproductive coercion in our case, we are referring to a form of gender-based violence, and it consists of some male partner behaviors that intend to reduce women's access uh, to the use of voluntary family planning services. And we, it's categorized into three aspects. One aspect is pregnancy coercion, where women um, are forced to become pregnant against their will, contraceptive sabotage, uh, limiting contraceptive choice. Now, it's important to mention that about half uh, of unmarried women in Kenya report that their current pregnancies are either mistimed or unintended, and women also experience high rates of uh, um, violence from male partners. And uh, in most cases, intimate partner violence is associated with contraceptive failure. So what is the ARCHES model? As I said, uh, ARCHES is an acronym for addressing reproductive coercion in health settings. And this is a brief intervention that is implemented within routine family planning practice. So we do not in, in invent anything new, but we just fit in within the existing family, practicing, 
family planning practice in our facilities, delivered by existing personnel within the health facility, and there is potential for scale-up and sustainability for this particular uh, model. That, uh, on average, there are up to a billion people who lack access to basic services. Secondly, another million people fall into poverty every year because of paying for health services. And it has been shown that a third of households in Africa and Southeast Asia have to borrow money whenever somebody falls sick and they have to seek treatment. And lastly is that there is a demonstrated return on investment. When we put money into health, it's been shown that an investment of just one dollar could translate to up to nine to twenty dollars. We also looked at how do we make it as a goal gradient so that you do not have to, you may not be able to get 500 shillings in a day, but you can get 20 shillings, you can get 100 shillings, just one dollar. If you can able to reinvent it in the phone, it can be able to uh, help you when you're actually sick, and this is able to, by the end of the month, you will have the 500 to pay for your premium. And many other methods that we use to ensure that these women can be able to save for their health care and are financially able to support themselves. The insurance field has always discriminated against women. They don't pay for gynecological problems. There are certain uh, illnesses they don't pay for that women suffer. Has this changed? If not, what can be done because the Constitution of Kenya is the number one defender and it has declared equity in all fields including inheritance. If women can inherit land, why can't we get full coverage like men? Thank you. One of the areas that we are looking at is to what extent are women getting information around Linda Mama program, which is basically a free maternity uh, service that is supposed to be given to women. And therefore, if you are not registered, it means that you cannot access the facility. You are not even aware what kind of services are offered under, three, uh, under this free maternity service that the government is providing. What is free when it comes to quality maternal health care? Those are the questions the government needs to answer. Do teenagers have reproductive health rights? Those are questions that we ask ourselves every time, especially if you work in the non-government sector, or if you're a lawyer and representing an adolescent in court or trying to champion for their rights, you also ask yourself whether the right for teenagers to, if the teenagers have a right to access family planning. But as long as you recognize them also as human beings, then they are part of this sustainable development goal. When you speak about health, you also speak about their health and all the services that they need. Sustainable Development Goal number 16 on peace, justice, and strong institutions. It calls for the reduction of all forms of violence. Now, reduction of sexual violence can be achieved through uh, uh, strengthened enforcement of laws in our jurisdictions, resolute court judgments, medical legal reports on sexual violence, which supports the survivor's account, meticulous history taking, which enables precise documentation and collection of trace evidence. Where you do not have a, a complainant who is able to articulate their case, maybe because of age or because they have a challenge, then the medical evidence is very, very important and should be given uh, in a proper way. I will go straight to the work that I do with specific reference to sexual violence. One of the cases in my portfolio happens to be women who suffered sexual violence in northern Uganda. One of the greatest challenges, of course, that I envisage in the courts of law is uh, presentation of evidence, and in particular, medical evidence. Um, I intend, of course, to rely on the expertise of medical personnel, especially those who offer psychosocial care and support because I do note that every time I go to the field to speak to these ladies, they exhibit the consequences of the trauma they underwent. So for me to impress it on the court, I will need a professional to do that. And uh, I'm glad to report that uh, we have quite a few that we are working with. And uh, we hope that we will be receiving justice at the end of it all. Let's look at what we found with just the abortion patients. And 
So we look at the individual data. These were youngish women. You can see most of them were between 20 and 29. Um, most of them were married. Level of education varied between primary, secondary. So most of them were around the secondary ed the education. Uh, with regards to the gestation, most of the gestation was early. It was less than 13 weeks, but some going even um, up to 28 weeks. We looked at incomplete, septic, and complete. And you can see, if we look at septic compared to the incomplete and the complete, we see that more women would die if they had a septic abortion. They would have a, no more chance of having a near miss. So you know that if you have a septic abortion, your complications are much higher. And the top methods was they use medication, that's mesoprostol, uh, or other procedures to empty out the uterus. They said they terminated the pregnancy at home or in a private facility or less commonly in a public facility. Where did they get the information? It was usually from friends and partners. And who helped them to terminate the, this pregnancy? It was mainly health practitioners, either the doctors or the nurses, and less commonly, their friends. Which is an indication that unsafe abortion continues to be a public health issue in Africa. So the way forward is to increase access to safe abortion services and family planning so that these unwanted pregnancies do not occur and women do not have to resort to unsafe abortions. Thank you. Key stakeholders who supported the conference included the United Nations Population Fund, UNFPA, and the Africa Union. I think for 100 years, the UN after 70 years has started to undergo some reform. And I think for the Medical Women International as well, it's time that our thinking, our approach, our strategy also has to begin to change. The knowledge you have shared in this room it's knowledge that you have as individuals, you have in your respective institutions, you have in the academic world. It is available. I think it's time that we have to begin to move into spaces that are unconventional. Because the change that would happen, as I said at the opening, would not happen in the families, it would not happen in your clinics, it will happen in the political space. And therefore, it is time that the numbers that you have begin to propel you to impact squarely on the political arena. And so I look forward to a time when this conference will not just be looking about women's health, child health, reproductive health, sexual health. It will be looking at things of moving the needle and impacting the space. Uh, but this morning I stand here on behalf of Ambassador Masharia Kamau, the Principal Secretary in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and a champion of the SDGs, having co-chaired their authorship and also a champion of women's rights. I want to reiterate that we must all recognize from the beginning that the UN Sustainable Development Goals and the aspirations of Africa's development as espoused in Agenda 2063 will not and cannot be achieved until and unless the challenges that face women and girls are comprehensively addressed. I bring you warm greetings from the African Union family the AU is a very big family. We have eight organs. Uh, organs, if you know the body, I'm talking to doctors, you have lungs, you have the heart, you have the brain, you have, AU has eight of them. And so I represent one of them. I'm in the African, Pan-African Parliament as a special advisor to the president, but also part of the African Union Commission, which is a secretariat of the whole of the AU. Ladies and gentlemen, the AU Agenda 2063 builds on this kind of initiatives, and later on we will be presenting Agenda 2063, and uh, we will uh, want you to ask us questions on how we intend to push the women's agenda beyond this KEMA conference. Having said that, ladies and gentlemen, Your Excellency the President, Your Excellency uh, Senator Moko, the, Mogo, the uh, Chief Guest, I want to say that the African Union is very pleased to be part of this process. 
I thank you. Other prominent stakeholders also graced the conference, and they all had some wisdom to share with the participants. Women's health means health for all, because women bring up a new generation. They are the future of this region. And it's only when we have a healthy population that society can develop and advance. The closing ceremony was marked with pomp and color. A leading Kenyan businesswoman, social entrepreneur, and Nairobi County Women's Representative, Ms. Esther Pasaris, graced the closing ceremony. So I want to commend you all for investing your time, investing your knowledge, sharing your experiences, because that is the only way that we can achieve the SDGs by 2030, we can achieve Agenda 2063, and we can make our world a better place and ensure that we leave no one behind. It is now with great pleasure that I declare the workshop officially closed. Thank you and God bless you. The conference was certainly a success with the participants raring to go to their member countries and implement some of the ideas and new knowledge gleaned from the conference. It really has been a wonderful meeting of heads, hearts and minds here. I have learned an awful lot. I have learned especially about the spirit of Ubuntu being our sisters keepers. So we are here in this meeting to share experiences, to share ideas, so that when we get back home, we'll be able to implement some of these new ideas and bring the African continent in line with the ideas and policies of the Medical Women International Association, of which this is a regional conference. It's an opportunity to get out there and make a difference, especially among people who are not able to afford services in urban centers. And I've been, uh, I've been excited to, to connect and to have a networking with the, the, the successful medical uh, women doctors from different countries and successful uh, mentors. Well, we should be bold because we've learned that most countries the parliament, the legislative system don't have enough women in key decision making part and then we don't come out to let our voice be heard. We are encouraged to take part in the politics and then enter into key decision making areas so that we can actually make policies that we that we impact positively on women. <laughs>